Welcome back class. I hope you guys are doing well. Today we're going to continue on with our final lecture for this week, session number three, looking at the Greek civilization. Today we're going to be looking at the Acropolis, which is a, an area in Athens, and uh, looking at some details with that. We're also going to be looking at um, a new aspect of Greece that you might not be familiar with, uh, which is Greek colonization because sometimes these city-states got crowded and they they pushed people out into different areas of the Mediterranean area or Mediterranean basin to colonize some different areas. So uh, we're going to be looking at Greek colonization and also the effects of uh, Greek colonization and what took place when they uh, established cities across the Mediterranean area, even up into the Black Sea uh, area. And then we're going to be looking at the Persian War uh, sometimes that's called, called the Greco-Persian War, and uh, this is where um, the Persians attacked, um, attacked Greece, att attacked Athens, and out of that um, came a league that uh, the city-states came together to uh, uh, kind of ally with, uh, align with each other to uh, protect one another, and obviously Athens being the main, uh, the main city, they became the leader of the league. And we're going to see some problems with that because Pericles, we're going to look at him, he was the most powerful uh, leader of Athens. Um, he began to uh, uh, do things with money that uh, he shouldn't have been doing. And he, he really irritated some of the other uh, colonies around the area that were sending money into Athens uh, for um, protection. So we're going to be looking at... Um, at a, a wide variety of things uh, today in the PowerPoint lecture, and uh, then I'll see you on the other side of it. Okay, class, we're going to have our final uh, PowerPoint presentation here for this week, uh, Ancient Greece, Session 3. We're going to continue on here uh, speaking about the Acropolis. The Acropolis, you may have heard of this term or this place in Athens, Greece. It's an ancient citadel on extremely rocky outcrop above Athens. Contains several ancient buildings. Uh, the most famous one that you're probably aware of is the Parthenon. I showed a picture of that in a previous lecture, and I um, have another picture coming up here. But this is where the Parthenon is located. Acropolis comes from the Greek word, a uh, combination of two Greek words. Uh, the first one is akron. Um, which means highest point, and polis, which we've talked about, means city. So um, Akron, polis, Acropolis, it means highest point of the city. And there's a picture of it again in, uh, in Athens. And so you see, I'll bring my mouse up here, see that arrow there? This is the Acropolis, this whole upper region here. And you can see these other buildings over here, temple or, or palace or something. Something's over here. I'm not sure what that is. But then here is the Parthenon. And you can go there today and see these ruins. Okay, let's talk more about the history of Greece. Um, this is in the 500s BC. Uh, the city-states, um, they're getting pretty crowded by now, and the resources of the city-states are becoming strained because of the population growth that is taking place in the city-states. So what happens is the citizens are, are being sent away to birth new cities. So the city-states and the polis that is in the center of that city-state are sending people away to create new colonies around the Mediterranean Sea basin. And they begin to move up into the Black Sea and begin to make colonies up in the Black Sea area. The main city is now called a metropolis. And the metropolis, that means mother city. And we, the, on the screen, there's a couple of settlements. Just as examples, you see Sicily. Uh, they have Neapolis, which means new city, or Naples. Uh, France, they settle in um, Marsalis, uh, southern France. Uh, Anatolia, which is in Turkey. There's a lot of settlements that take place on Anatolia, as we're going to see here coming up. And then southern Ukraine, which is up in the Black Sea area, uh, they begin to settle up in there. So they're spreading out. So on this map, it's kind of a generic map, I guess. Uh, you see my cursor there. So here's, here's Crete, what I'm circling there. 
that's Crete, and then obviously you see Greece, and over here is Turkey, and that's, that's what we call it, Anatolia. And they move up here through this little tiny strait, it's called the Strait of Dardanelles, and then this little spot here, that's the city of Istanbul, it used to be called Constantinople, but now it's called Istanbul. Well, there's a, a strait through there. You can go through there into the Black Sea. So that dot is kind of covering it up because Istanbul is right on that little strait of water that goes into the Black Sea. And up here is Ukraine. So the Greeks uh, moved all the way up into here. And then we talked about France a second ago. Okay, so here's Sicily. And then we talked about France. That's over in here. So you see that the Greeks are kind of spreading out now. They want to relieve the strain on their city-states by sending out people to birth new cities in these little colonies. These new colonies began to bring in resources themselves uh, to the new colony itself, and also it was coming going back to Greece also. They were taking things back to Greece through trade. So we see copper, zinc, tin, iron ore, and uh, trade flourished also. Uh, from the Black Sea region, they, they started getting a lot of things uh, from up there in Ukraine, and which is basically southern Russia. Um, grain, fish, furs, timber, honey, wax, gold, amber. And interestingly, slaves uh, were captured in southern Russia and taken back to Greece. Uh, the new colonies, uh, some of them which were quite distant from their mother city. Remember I said, well, you go all the way over to France or Sicily, up into the Black Sea area, it's, it can get kind of far away. Um, they did not rely on their mother city, uh, but began to direct their own courses. So the city, they became a little more independent, and they weren't relying heavily on the mother city anymore. They began to direct their own course and future. So the effects of Greek colonization, uh, obviously communication of ideas. That usually always happens whenever colonies are formed because... Is spreading out, ideas spread. Um, spreading of the Greek language and culture around the Mediterranean Sea basin. Political and social effects. And what we're going to talk about now is the Persian War. That was an effect of Greek colonization because the Greeks began to settle on Anatolia, which is modern-day Turkey. I'll go back to that map. Okay, so this is Anatolia, and they began to, to, to settle along here, but they didn't own this land. They didn't own Anatolia. They were settling there, but they didn't own Anatolia. The Persians owned Anatolia. So let's talk about the Persian War here for a minute. This is the Greeks against the Persians. Sometimes it's called the Greco-Persian War. But... What happens is Cyrus and then Darius I, we talked about them when we looked at Persia, uh, they begin to tighten their grip on Anatolia, which is Turkey. The Greek colonies that were on Anatolia began to feel the Persian pressures, their suppression of them. And Ionia revolts, they revolted against the Persians. But what happened was the Ionians... Uh, they beat the Persians out of the area, so the Persians are beaten out. What happens is, because of these pressures, and now this little battle that, that took place, Athens begins to heavily support the baby cities on Anatolia. The, the new colonies that were birthed, the citizens spread out and started the new colonies, these baby cities. Well, Athens begins to support them. But Darius comes flying in, and the Greeks are crushed by Darius in 493 B.C. And to further punish the Greeks, Darius moves out of Anatolia and comes across to mainland Greece, and he uh, sends his army towards Athens. But unfortunately for him, the Athenians, the people of Athens, the army of Athens, destroy the Persians at the Battle of Marathon. Even though 
they are badly outnumbered. The Athenians still win. And they win just in time that the Athenians quickly return to Athens to beat off the Persian navy that was attempting to land at Athens. So not only did they beat the army at Marathon, they went back and they beat the Persian navy. Xerxes, we talked about him before, Xerxes tries again, and even though he invades and burns Athens, so he's actually able to get in and invade, he is driven out as well. And the details of that attack, Xerxes attacked with 100,000 soldiers and 1,000 ships, but he still could not beat Athens. The Greek navy destroyed the Persian navy, the 1,000 ships of the Persian navy at the Battle of Salamis. And the Greek navy wins. The Greek forces rout the Persians and drive them from Anatolia. So this is a good day for the Greeks and a bad day for the Persians. And we see here a couple of pictures. Uh, one is a land battle there. Uh, does not look like a good time. They are, they are fighting. And then we see this soldier overlooking the ships there in, in the ocean. So just uh, some artistic representation of the Persian War. So following this, the Greeks decide to develop a league, and that's called the Delian League. The Delian League is an alliance of the city-states and the colonies for protection. Now this league was formed to discourage other invaders like the Persians. So the Persians didn't have a successful time fighting against Athens. Well now they're making a league of a bunch of Greek city-states to beat off any invaders. And because Athens had a superior navy, Athens becomes the leader of the league. And what the deal was with the league was that Athens would supply the military and the navy might, and the other cities would supply the money. But that causes a problem. Because the money coming into Athens was not used for the military. It was funneled to vast building projects under the leadership of Pericles. And what happens is there's serious conflicts that arise among the Greek polis, which is the plural polis, because of this misuse of money. So I'm just going to drop a map here for you. And this is um, kind of an, an idea of the Delian League. Um, here in the orange is, is Athens, the territory around Athens. There's the city of Athens. And you see it's sticking out there in the water. That's why they have such a great navy. But all of these little yellow territories and dots, they all have... Um, little cities and what it is is that these cities are in the league and they're funneling money into Athens for protection and Athens is going to supply the army and the navy to protect them especially over here along Anatolia because the Persians even though they were driven back they're still over there and they're sending money into Athens, and Athens, instead of building up the military and using it to protect these these uh, city state or these cities that are in the league, they end up using it to build vast building projects within Athens. So Pericles he ruled Athens from 461 to 429 BC. So that's quite a long time. He ruled at the high tide of Athenian power, so Athens definitely was at the peak of their power. He was an aristocrat, but was very popular with the lower class. And the reason he was very popular with the lower class was the next point on the slide. He put many lower class people, uh, men, they would have been men, lower class men in positions of government authority. So that's definitely going to cause the lower class to like you. He 
spent money from these polis that were sending their money into Athens on massive public works, and it put many people to work. Many people were employed. And it wasn't slaves. It was the, these were artisans. These were um, construction workers, stonemasons. These were skilled people for these v massive public works. Also during his reign, uh, there was a rise in culture. And uh, uh, I did it again. That's supposed to say science, uh, not, not cerns or whatever that says. Uh, science, another typo. Sorry about that. Science, philosophy, poets, drama, art, architecture. So when you start thinking now of the um, the high mark of Greek culture with these different things, like philosophy or or drama, Greek drama with the plays or, or architecture, art with statues. Uh, this is the time period of it. And there's our man Pericles under his leadership. The time was known as the Golden Age of Greece. You might want to know that. And you can see Pericles there with his, his warlike helmet propped up on his head and his little curly beard. And he looks like a, a ruler of Athens. Okay, class, that's it for this week. This is the end of... Uh, session number three, again, continue with your reading. Make sure you're, you're uh, up to date there with the syllabus. Don't forget, Friday you have to have your paper emailed in. And so uh, um, make sure you do that. Also, do not forget, please do not forget, you must run your paper through Grammarly. Uh, just a quick little story. Uh, I did my paper that is due for my PhD seminar. It's due uh, tomorrow morning. Again, this, uh, this video, I'm making all my videos today on Sunday afternoon. And so, uh, so that they're up for by midnight tonight for you guys for this coming week. And so my paper is due tomorrow. Well, I finished my paper this past week. It's, it uh, came out to be about 27 pages long with the bibliography is 27 pages. And in those 27 pages, I had like 398 uh, mistakes when I ran it through Grammarly. Grammarly will find your mistakes, and it found mine. I had 398 uh, mistakes. And you know, as you're typing fast, there's misspellings and there's grammar things that you don't that that you miss. Well, uh, by the time uh, when I when I uploaded it to Grammarly, my score was like a 57. That's just a Grammarly score. Okay, it's not not, not like I got a 57 on the paper. It's it's just a score that Grammarly gives you for for the number of mistakes compared to your paper length and all that. Why well, at 57? And so by, by the end of my Grammarly check, and as I go through each mistake, and if, do I correct it or or not, depending on what it is, it the score improves. And so by the time I ran my entire paper through Grammarly, my paper it came out with a score of 98, and um, the few things that that I couldn't correct were basically within quotes of from books, and so I had to quote and I had to put the exact words that the author of that book used. Well, the author of the book would have a problem in the you know, using passive passive tense in a sentence or something like that, and so Grammarly would still gig me on it because I could not uh, correct that quote. It's, it's from a book. So Grammarly, it does its job, and you guys, you run it through Grammarly, you'll be you'll be all star writers. And um, so if if I get a paper in, uh, you know everyone's got to send it to me through email, including the classroom students have to send me the electronic copy. I'm going to put it through Grammarly, and if it comes up that you didn't run it through Grammarly, I'm I'm just going to send it back to you because you need to run it through there to correct those mistakes. Use this uh, use Grammarly; it's there for you guys, and it really improves. Uh, your writing. I'm really looking forward to to reading your papers, and um, and and I hope you guys put a lot of effort uh, in into the papers. It's a, a good opportunity to be able to learn something new, but also practice your uh, your writing. So um, other than that, that's it for this week. I hope you guys uh, have a great weekend, and I'll see you next time. Take care.